And welcome to a simultaneously nostalgic and anti-nostalgic episode of the Oddity Archive. The show that digs up more figurative corpses than Dr. Frankenstein, or Frankenstein, himself. So anyway, not too terribly long ago, I got a YouTube comment thanking me for realizing that older doesn't necessarily equal better. And specifically, this was on one of the archive thrifting episodes and some bit where I was going through a used record bin and made some really quick offhand comment about 60s easy listening garbage. But uh, for whatever strange reason, that comment just stuck with me. I mean, I, I always do try and keep a certain affection for the things that I cover, although I am quite guilty of uh, cranking up the crankiness. But uh, it did get me thinking that, yeah, we probably could use the occasional object lesson in objectively bad stuff. Although I'm sure there are some out there that'll argue me to the death on this. But uh, regardless, let's turn the clock back to the 1980s here and take a look at one of the side effects of the then new, really, bounty of off-air and cable TV choices. And that particular side effect being how to fill all this airtime. So with that, today I have handpicked three sitcoms that were all born out of this need for content. And these are all syndicated, uh, here in the U.S. at least, and all date to the latter half of the 80s. When I was a little kid and my parents would want to be intimate, they would send me to look out the window. <laughs> and then my dad would say, so what do you see in the window? I said, our neighbors being intimate. <laughs> He said, how can you tell? I said, because their son is looking at me. In whatever meager comedy cred I may have, I think I'm probably one of the incredibly few of the current breed of, again, loosely, comedians that would defend Yakov Smirnoff. Of course, Smirnoff is best known for his corny, late-period Cold War jokes, particularly the recurring... In America, you fill in the blank. In the Soviet Union, fill in the blanks, you. In America, there is plenty of light beer and you can always find a party. In Russia, party always finds you. I find there's a certain heart to Smirnov's humor, especially when he reminisces about growing up behind the Iron Curtain and finding humor to be his best defense and when necessary, weapon. sense of humor, uh, uh, you know, would get me in trouble in Russia a lot. I mean, uh, in school especially, we had a teacher who was not very friendly, and one time she said to the class, anybody who's not smart, stand up. And I stood up. <laughs> and she said, Yakov, you're pretty smart. I said, I know, but I didn't want you to be the only one standing. <laughs> I'm a portable fan. I brought enough for the whole class. So the notion of Yakov getting a part, but not necessarily the lead, in a sitcom revolving around a classroom of immigrants studying for their citizenship tests, on paper seems like a perfectly decent idea, and appropriately one named after Yakov's catchphrase. What a country! Smirnov's sitcom was an adaptation of a British series called Mind Your Language. I think I can safely say that What a Country was a watered-down version of Mind Your Language, but in an odd way. In Mind Your Language, the students were almost entirely blatant stereotypes and often drove their teacher crazy. What a Country softened the stereotypes, and the students openly loved their teacher. Conversely, in my opinion, Mind Your Language was simply better written. Everything about what a country feels limp and lazy, right down to the drugstore knockoff Randy Newman theme song. I wanna say what I got to say. I wanna be an American in 
the land of the free Wanna be an American It's right for me That's why we all came to America But that doesn't mean that we change who we are I'm still Maria Conchita Lopez I just dress a lot better as I mentioned, Yakov Smirnov was not the lead in this show, which was probably not a wise move. Smirnov would have been not only the best known performer, but also the most charismatic. To add insult to injury, his role is all too often severely limited, and his character's side hustle as a small time con man never gets explored the way it should have. Lord knows it's a more interesting backstory than any other character on the show. On top of that, Don Knotts was brought on for a few episodes later in the series' run as an ex-Marine, now school principal. A wasted opportunity, as Knotts is relegated to playing an, at best, slightly more assertive version of his Mr. Furley character from Three's Company. Tellingly, What a Country never really gained any commercial momentum and was cancelled after one season. In the Rasha, we played KGB sets. <laughs> Only if you lose, you out the window. But you both got to keep this a secret. This one first came to my attention via a 30 second promo that I found on an old ghosty off air recording from late 1988, which speaks for itself. I thought my life was tough then. You should see me now as a high school vice principal. And there's one thing I can teach you that sooner or later you're going to have to make it on your own. And integrity and self-respect are two things that you just can't buy. As a single parent of two hormone-driven teenagers? Dad, she's out of control. Me? I'm out of control! And as the masked maniac. That masked maniac is a total animal. Good analysis. Watch me in Learning the Ropes. Saturday at 6.30 p.m. on KTVD-TV. Needless to say, I had to hit up YouTube to see if I could find an episode. I guess you could say I wasn't disappointed. Anyway, Learning the Ropes was a vehicle for former NFL defensive end slash amateur boxer Lyle Alzado, and dare I say an appropriate one. While best remembered as a professional athlete, Alzado held a degree in physical education with an emphasis on secondary education. Alzado was also known to be quite involved with youth programs, anti-drug, etc., Though, uh, oddly enough, Alzado was a big-time steroid user. Anyway, in Learning the Ropes, Alzado played a single dad, private school vice principal, who moonlighted as professional wrestler, the Masked Maniac. Can you speak to you for a minute? Sure. Excuse me, ladies. See you in the ring, Maniac. Yes, Maniac fighting me. After I give him sickle, you see him in Fletcher Ward. <laughs> He just talks like that. Underneath all that, no heart. Whatever potential this idea may have had was let down by some truly dreadful writing. For example, Alzado's wrestling gig is supposed to be a secret, ostensibly over fear of losing his day job because of it. Problem is, just about the entire cast is well aware of Alzado's wrestling. Another massive issue is that at least a few minutes of every 21-22-ish minute episode is devoted to clips of NWA wrestling. A bit of cross-promotion there. In the footage I found, even if the masked maniac is in it, it's not Alzado, it appears to be played by someone else. Having said that, the only real humor I found in this situation comedy is from the NWA wrestlers, or I think at times actors posing as wrestlers, when they appear in the locker room after a fight, or more amusingly, get together at Alzado's house, it can be fairly entertaining. If anything, I'd much rather see a sitcom about those wrestlers. Granted, it would be surreal as all hell, but there'd be no shortage of comic potential, 
And given that this was the golden age of surreal shows like ALF and Small Wonder, you'd think that would have been the more viable sitcom. Hey, Road Warriors, now you guys are invited to my party Saturday too, you know. I ain't never been to a party. What do you do? Superhawk, you mingle. We don't mingle, we mangle. <laughs> but instead, we're treated to an extremely tame, predictable late 80s sitcom loaded with minor, usually family, misunderstandings that are easily resolved by the end of each episode. Did I mention this show is actually Canadian? These Savemar TV audio and video centers are incredible. They deliver your merchandise in 10 minutes. Would you believe fast? Savemar has over a million locations. Would you believe 21 and growing? Savemar has been in business since 1492. Would you believe over 30 years? Speaking of American-aimed Canadian shows, let's move on to as close to a success as anything in this episode got. Now, before we get to check it out proper, I should say that Get Smart may very well be my favorite sitcom of all time. If not, it's damn close. So I'm already predisposed toward liking anything with Don Adams. With that in mind, the 80s weren't terribly kind to Don Adams. Well, save for Inspector Gadget, but that only lasted two non-consecutive seasons. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, the cherry on top of this rocky period was, check it out. Hello shoppers, welcome to Car. Special today, French on melons, two for a dollar. Ain't it a pity when you're living in the city and I'm working in a grocery store? Like What a Country, Check It Out had an exclamation point in its name, but more notably was based on a British series. Namely, the short-lived Tripper's Day, which lasted for six whole episodes in the fall of 1984. Uh, granted, six episodes due to the death of its lead actor, but still. Anyway, in other words, Check It Out far outlasted its source material. Well, it's a big improvement over Indian Week. As I recall, during Indian Week, you were all a little bit confused. Some of you came as Gandhi, and some of you came as Geronimo. Like the other two sitcoms we've discussed today, on paper, Check It Out seemed like a good idea. Don Adams played grocery store manager Howard Bannister, and he would preside over a motley crew of employees. Uh, and not the band. Once again, the show is sunk by bad writing but in this case, easily avoided bad writing. I personally think that Check It Out would have been better served by Adams playing straight man to his employees. Hell, it would have given Adams a nice contrast from the typecasting he endured because of his Maxwell Smart character. But no, Adams plays a borderline incompetent klutz with an awkwardly inflated ego. Kind of like Maxwell Smart. As such, whereas Get Smart succeeded in part due to its balance of nuts and straights, Check It Out is all nuts and is lopsided because of it. The rare moments of genuine humor from this show are more due to Adams' skill as an actor and his knack for physical humor. With a zany bunch of employees like this. Howard Bannister's office. I'm not taking any calls. He's not taking any calls. The only memorable member of the supporting cast is actress Dinah Christie, who plays Adams' secretary and sporadic love interest, Edna. Problem is, she's as close to a relatable character as the show has. If anything, her position in the ensemble would have been better held by Don Adams and her efforts wind up not carrying the weight they should in context. If she was supposed to be the 99 to Adams' usual 86 Maxwell Smart character, she wasn't given assertive enough lines or motives to make an impact on Adams or any of the other store employees. And that's this show in a nutshell. 
everything feels completely futile. Oh yeah, and you rarely see customers in this store. Okay, I promise I won't laugh. Morning. I wish you'd stop wearing all that jewelry to work. Joan Collins just applied for a job as a checker. <laughs> Howard, look down. Smile. It's worth noting that while this did air in syndication on usually Tribune-owned local stations in the U.S., the show's entire run also happened on cable on the USA Network. But I won't hold that against USA. Somehow this show managed to last a whole three seasons, running from 1985 to 88, which is pretty dang impressive given the utter lack of character development between the first and last episodes, unless you count Adams' die job and stash. Anyway, as of this episode, the entire series can be seen on the Pluto TV app. Hope you're prepared to sit through about 30 seconds of especially annoying commercials for every minute of content. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I continue to try and get my own sitcom, uh, KFDG, the wackiest radio station in America, picked up by a TV network. Any TV network. Or even just some individual TV station, my own notwithstanding. Seriously, I have dumped way too much money into this turd to give up now. Next time on KFDG, Ben finds himself tied up in knots. It's like cable spaghetti! <laughs> it's the wackiest radio station in America, KFDG. Saturday nights at 8 on KLAK 31. Nothing's gonna keep us from Nothing's gonna keep us from Learning to grow